Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Travel Vault webinar. My name is Christina Brazier, and I'm the Operations Director at the Travel Vault. Uh, today, we are joined by the team at Travel Trade Consultancy, as well as a special guest for today, Helen Coop, MD of Travel at Four Communications. We don't have Farina Razan with us today, but if you do have any legal questions, then please feel free to email me and um, I will be happy to liaise with her directly. Today, we will have our usual updates on the latest developments in the industry and from a financial perspective. And then Helen will be giving us an insight on the media in the current climate. And then Martin will be going through some of the key questions that travel businesses should be thinking about for the future. As usual, all attendees will be muted, but we welcome any questions either through the Q&A function on Zoom or by emailing me direct. So first, Martin, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us what's been happening this week in the industry, that would be lovely. Yeah, no problem, Chris. Uh, morning, everyone. So look, it, probably quite a, a short update for me because I, I, I think um, in many respects, nothing's really happening. It just feels like the, the slowest moving car crash of all time, really. Um, we, we've talked a lot about the requests on government to extend this refund window Again, listening to the APTA call this week, I, 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 my feeling is really that APTA, you know, in, in some respects, look, look the head of public affairs all, all but through the towel in really on it. I, I think that there's definitely a feeling that government aren't going to, to move on this deadline. Um, in, interestingly, on the, the, the appearance that Mark Tanza, the, Ab, the APTA chief executive, made on the Transport Select Committee hearing just yesterday, he re repeated that call for help for government to extend that window, but then added this sort of second option that if government won't do that, then can they at least step in, make the refunds on behalf of the travel companies and, 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 and then, you know, find a way to, to recoup that. So it seems like ABTA is already starting to say that their, their primary aim is, is, is sort of less and less likely. Um, the, the, the hearing, I think, I don't know if, if, if anyone else managed to watch it. My, my reading of it again was that, um, it, it was a it was a formality, really, a tick box exercise. I didn't really feel like the the, the government um, representatives sitting on that hearing really got to grips with the issues. If anything, they seem to be mainly focused on on airlines and the lack of refunds. And so, if we did see anything, it, it might be some some more kind of um, stringent commentary around airlines and their obligations to to, to pay back cash down the chain to tour operators. Um, but but I think you, you know beyond that. Abter again re repeated the, the kinds of claims that they've made, which is which is that the furlough scheme, as it's currently designed, isn't isn't really helping travel companies. Uh, repeated the, the the sort of warnings that major travel companies, very strong, up until a few months ago, well-run travel companies would would fail as a consequence of this. It, it just didn't really feel like there's there's any anything imminent. I think what we might see. Um, possibly as early as next week, is, is an announcement from the Civil Aviation Authority, which is again something ABTA has called for, to confirm that the, these refund credit notes are financially protected. I mean, in our view, it's not necessary because it's, that's already clear from the way the legislation's drafted. But I think having a voice from the CAA confirm that, I think, I think would be helpful. So we might see something on that next week. Um, but yeah, really, that that issue just feels like it'll keep rolling on. Abtra will keep plugging away at it. But it, it just the, the updates sound more and more, um, or more or less and less optimistic. I would say. So I think on to the, the next big issue. I think which is starting to, to to come to the fore has already been in some cases, but but certainly is going to become more prominent. Is is this is this risk or or, or issue around balance due dates? So many tour operators would have a ten week collection date, and, and ten weeks from this week takes you to um the, the the 15th 16th of july sort of time frame so over the next weeks or, or, or so agents and operators would be expecting to collect their final balances for, for those holidays we're still sitting here without really much of an idea of how the lockdown will be eased and when things might get back to, to normal certainly going to run through some more some more thoughts on that a bit later in, in my session but i guess it, it it has the potential to really raise the issue again because it's obviously quite an emotive situation anyway with customers needing the money and not being able to get refunds if we have this issue of, of tour operators collecting final balances for holidays where there's less certainty of them being taken you could certainly see that that will that will ramp up the the, the mentions and the pressure in the, in the consumer media again i think it's a really difficult position for tour operators to be in because 
you know, it's as we, as we keep saying on these calls, terms and conditions apply for all of those. There's there's, there's no um, requirement or obligation for you to be cancelling holidays beyond the next few weeks, really. And so there's, there, there is a possibility, albeit maybe slim, that some of those can, can take place. Um, there's pressure from, from some angles, particularly the, the travel agents, to reduce the balance collection date. So if it was 10 weeks, maybe try to make it four or five weeks. Obviously, that has knock-on effect if you've got your own contractual commitments with suppliers down, down the food chain. Um, so I think every tour operator has to make, make their own decision, really, based on the, the, the commercial situation. But you can certainly see it's going to be a, a challenge and, and it's going to, be, it's going to create um, ill feeling with consumers if it, hasn't, if it isn't handled correctly. But I guess we'll, we'll hear a lot more about that in the, in the coming weeks. So I think that that was kind of it for me. Not not really a huge update. Um, it, it, it much more feels, you know, as as we were last week. Really, back to you, Chris. Thanks, Martin. That's really helpful. Um, one of the issues that our members continue to face is, is getting refunds from um, suppliers, and particularly. Uh, airlines continue to be a problem. Uh, we talked in previous webinars about how they're issuing vouchers and um, it seems that there's some uh, inconsistency between whether vouchers are issued in the customer name or the company name. Um, have you seen any about anything on that at all? I mean is there, we've got one member who B British Airways are insisting on the customer name being on the ticket, but unfortunately they're actually changing the, the, the passengers, so they, they want it to be in their company name. Is there any pushback on that at all with airlines? Um, my reading of this is that the, there's no fixed rule, that, that, this, that they aren't following any kind of regulations or, or obligations on this. It, it does come down to the, the, the commercial reality. Um, so I, I guess pushing back, pushing back as much as you can you know, understand that the, there are obviously some small operators and, and, and BA are also commercially much more powerful in, in, in the debate. Um, I, I think, you know, an, an allied risk to that is, is the anecdotal stuff we're hearing about when you come to try and use these vouchers, but, but currently the, the flights on sale for the following year are significantly more expensive. There's a lot of uncertainty about what routes are actually going to be running next year. Um, you know, obviously Virgin pulling out of, of Gatwick, BA talking about uh, retrenching, EasyJet looking at, at com combining routes, you know, you could conceivably get um, a, a significantly smaller flight plans. I think BA's news this morning was that they're, they're, they're sort of planning for 50% capacity reduction for, for, the, for the foreseeable, to, for the next 12 months. Um, so all of that is going to create real difficulties with, with the unwinding of these um, the vouchers, but I, I appreciate the name, the name point is difficult. Thank you. It just continues to be a challenging uh, climate for everyone. Yeah. Um, Adam, uh, you've been busy uh, working, continue to work with your clients and providing financial assistance with them. And last week you talked to us about the bounce back loan, uh, the new bounce back loan being launched. Now that it's live, um, can you tell us about your experiences on that? Yeah, sure. No problem. Morning, everybody. Um, I, I think since last week, just, just very quickly, C-bills C continues to, to kind of, uh, chug along at, but at a very slow pace. I think that's been further affected by by the release of the bounce back, bounce back scheme on Monday. Uh, so my up to date re update today really is going to focus around that. Um, it was reported that on day one lenders received in the region of seventy thousand loans um, and were being processed worth around two billion. R roughly fifty percent of these were approved in the first forty eight hours. And uh, so in, a, in only a few short days, they've managed to distribute the same amount of money, which is which is equal to roughly 50% of what's been issued under C-bills in the first six weeks. So definitely some positive news and businesses are, are getting access to cash quicker, which is really good. I, I think based on last week, it's definitely worth mentioning some of the, the features and the elig eligibility that's changed. Um, we, ex we expected low interest rates, and they've, uh, we've seen across the board they've been set at 2.5%, uh, so I think that's quite good. Uh, the loan term is fixed uh, at six years, uh, with nothing to pay in the first 12 months. Um, and loans can be converted from, I think we saw this last week actually, so they can be converted if you've got a C-bills, they can go from C-bills to bounce back, uh, but we've also found out yesterday that they can go from a bounce back to a C-bills. And so if you find yourself getting a bounce back, but you don't have 
or you need further cash injection down the line, as long as you're fully refinancing that, you can go from a bounce back uh, to a CVILS loan. In terms of eligibility, um, not, not much has changed from last week. Uh, unlike the CVILS, though, it's mostly around self-certification. And so I think it's important to be aware that you're <coughs> going to be signing off on a lot of these uh, that could potentially be audited at, at a later date. Um, so this is not an exhaustive list, but I think some, some points that are worth, worth running through. So you need to self-certify that you've been impacted by COVID-19. Um, the point last week was around uh, not being in difficulty or financial difficulty at the 31st of December 19. And I wasn't quite clear on how that will be defined. Uh, but we now know that this is going to be defined by an EU regulation, um, which actually means it in layman's terms that your accumulated losses in your last set of financial statements can't be greater than 50% of your issued share capital. Um, and so we see that being a bit of a problem for you know some companies in particular i'm thinking you know startups or if you've experienced some financial difficulty in recent times then that that could present a bit of a problem uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't apply though if your company is less than three years old uh, which may be some relief for, for those in the startup camp um, you can't be in currently in bankruptcy proceedings or liquidation proceedings uh, 50 percent of your income uh, needs to come from a trading activity um, and you also need to be established in the UK and trading before the 1st of March 2020. Um, in terms of who, who is offering the loans, so the scheme started with around nine accredited lenders, that is somewhat off the 49 accredited under C bills, um, <clears throat> although as, as of this morning there are now 14 and so we are seeing that the British Business Bank uh, are accrediting lenders at you know a reasonable pace but may, maybe not as quick as they could uh, we'll expect we're expecting that to grow over the coming days um, a, as with c bills though it is quicker to apply to your current banking provider uh, even though a lot of the criteria um, is self-certified as i said they still need to undertake you know general kyc or aml checks and so the process will be a lot quicker if you're already a banking customer um, it is worth checking if your bank are on the list uh, or if if they're not on the list, check with them to see if they're currently applying to be accredited by the British Business Bank. Um, it, 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 as I said, it will be a lot quicker, I think, to wait uh, for your banking provider to become accredited uh, as opposed to registering uh, as a new customer with a new bank. I think that, that would make things a bit slower for you. In terms of the process itself, we have gone through the process ourselves. Uh, with some clients. I think the main point here is that it is incredibly easy and only takes a matter of minutes. Uh, the, you do need to have only a few few details really, which are ma mainly your bank details. You'll need to self-certify on the, on the points I spoke about earlier. Um, the other key bit of information you're going to need is your 2019 calendar turnover, uh, because as, as you know, the scheme is limited to 25% of that turnover up to a maximum of 50,000. Um, we have seen demand uh, is very, very high. Um, and so, although some are being approved very quickly, we are seeing up to around five days before you get money into your bank. Um, I think that's it, that's it for me on, on the bounce back, unless anyone has any questions. The only other thing I wanted to mention today around the finance side of things, uh, is really on the furloughing so people would have already claimed for April uh, but as of as of next week uh, we can apply for furloughing two weeks in advance uh, and so as of next week people should really start to be thinking about what their furlough claim looks like for May uh, but that, that's it for me Chris and unless anyone has any questions Thanks, Adam. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, firstly, uh, just because you just talked about furloughing, um, there has been some talk, uh, particularly in the travel industry and campaigning for the furlough to be extended beyond the 30th of June. Have you heard any rumblings of that, or whether that is potentially likely? I haven't, haven't heard. I've heard, heard that and also heard, um, you know, the concept around you know, I think, I think Mark um, Tanza mentioned it on, on the Parliament Live yesterday. Yeah. Um, you know, the concept of trying to, to split 
the cost, uh, but allow people crucially to work in the travel industry. It, we've certainly seen in, in reality that, you know, a lot of travel businesses are having to keep people on mostly to deal with refunds really. And so, you know, they're not necessarily generating revenue as such, which is, which is why uh, people aren't allowed to work under the furlough scheme. And, and so it would seem logical to allow some, some people back to work, but, but perhaps split the cost. But certainly, what you know, both of those ideas are only you know rumours at the moment, and nothing, nothing firm as yet. And of course, as soon as we hear anything, we'll uh, we'll let members know, um, you know, if there is any update on that. Yeah. Um, so, oh, so I was going to say, I think it'll be interesting to see what what comes out on Sunday. Perhaps yeah. gets mentioned around then. But yeah, certainly, as as soon as we know everything that anything that's factual, we'll we'll let everybody at Travel World know. Thank you. And um, a couple of questions on the bounce back loan. Um, can you just clarify if they pay, if a member takes out the loan and pays it back before the year end, is there any early repayment charge? No, no. So there, so the, the interest is, is still payable in the first 12 months, but it's actually paid uh, by the British business bank. Uh, if the business itself decides to repay that because they don't, they don't need it, then there are no early repayment charges. Okay, thank you. And um, you answered, I know one of our members previously asked about um, whether you can go, take out a bounce back loan and then change to a C-bills if you decide that you need more, which you've said that you can do. Um, obviously, the key difference between the two loans, or one of the differences is, is the interest rate. Um, so the question is, if you've got a 2.5% on your bounce back loan and then you need an additional amount, so you have to apply for a C-bills, is there any indication on what that rate would be for the, follow, for the further 50k, for example, if they were wanted to take out 100? It's not, and it, and it comes back to, um, I think there must have been a conversation, it, all of the banks are offering 2.5%, so it, it must be set as part of the scheme um, for the bounce back. But under the C bills, obviously there is a commercial decision by the bank because they're on risk for a portion of that loan. And so I think it comes back to previous conversations we've had, um, you know, on other webinars, uh, and you'll start to see a range across banks. You know, as we've seen before, they have been from anywhere from 2.8 up to five and a half percent, and that will be on a, you know, on a risk assessment by by the lender. Uh, at that point, I think the the there's a couple of things I did mention earlier. So they would going either way, they would need to be fully refinanced. So you, you can't end up with a with a bounce back and the C bills in existence at the same time. Yeah. The other thing which I didn't mention earlier, uh, which is an idea for travel companies, if you if you've got a transport company, which some travel world members may or may not have, then then in theory you could meet the criteria for bounce back under your travel company or transport company and your you know your trading company uh, and so that that is an idea that could be considered because you could have two bounce back loans under two separate companies and that might get you to where you need as opposed to going for a c bills under one entity okay thank you that's helpful and um one of our members has said that um or is asking if the 2.5 percent is the same for all banks because they looked into it uh, yesterday and their bank who was on the list seemed to be charging for 6.5 percent that seems ludicrous. Um, I, I, I've only seen, uh, I've checked out the major lenders. Um, so we've looked this week, we've looked at HSBC, Barclays, Lloyds, uh, and they're all at two and a half percent. And actually, I think, one second, sorry, I've got it in front of me. It's all right. It's a bit, uh, hot off the press. Um, I'm pretty sure. It's on the, uh... Maybe we can feed that back um, oh, later on if you've... Yeah, oh. sorry, sorry, sorry to delay. Um, no, that's all right. It's, set under, it's actually set under the bounce back scheme rules. That it is 2.5% per annum. Uh, okay. And so I think it's worth going back to that bank because that, that's coming from the British Business Bank who are, you know, the, the overarching... Uh, mechanism for the scheme so uh, i'm a bit surprised to hear that actually okay so they should definitely push back and say that you know that that's not um how Absolutely. it should be thanks for that 
Um, and just sorry, we, we've had another question on the furlough. I don't know whether whether Martin or Matt would be um, more uh, able to answer this one, just because um, asking whether ABTA is pushing for the furlough to be extended on behalf of the travel industry um, and again, potentially splitting the cost. Is that something that we should be asking ABTA to do, lobbying the government to do? Chris, I'm happy to jump in there. I'm not sure what Matt thinks, but my reading of it is that what ABTA is pushing on is, is not necessarily extending the time period of the scheme. But it's this issue that actually right now, you, travel companies need their employees to, to fend off the multiple requests for refunds, to manage customers, to, to basically help customers to help that whole refund process. And if everybody's sat at home, we can't do that. And so I, I, I understood from what ABTA was asking that they were, they were asking for some relaxation of, of that part of it rather than extending it beyond uh, the, the, the current end date. Um, what, what, one thing I'd just add to that is actually if, if my reading of the, of the news and, and the direction of travel on this over the last week or so really is the, the, the comments from the Chancellor, not just about travel, about all sectors talking about creating a dependency on, on these um, the, the, these kind of government steroids and how, how the government sort of weans people off them over the, the coming weeks and there's speculation that you know we might hear a bit more about that as early as Sunday when some of the lockdown um, information is, is or the, or the um, reduction in lockdown information is released. But talk of that scheme being gradually unwound between now and September is, is probably more what I'm reading. Again, no, no reason why that couldn't be sector by sector and maybe travel gets some special dispensation. But as I say, I, I believe what Abtu is asking for is not, not that at this point. OK, thank you for clarifying that. OK, so um, if anyone has any other questions for Adam or anyone at TTC, then please feel free to um, send them through on the Q&A function and uh, we can always come back to them at the end. Um, but for now, um, I'd like to move on to our guest speaker, Helen Coop. Helen is MD of Travel uh, at Four Communications um, and she's been with them for nine years, but I believe uh, 25 years in the travel industry. And Helen's going to be providing us with an insight into the media during this current time and how, um, how you can emerge through this crisis. Thank you so much for joining us, Helen. No worries, no worries. Um, okay, I'll, I'll kick off. I, I'm try, I tried not to do death by PowerPoint, so I will move through fairly swiftly. Um, and obviously we can um, discuss further at the end. So um, really my role today is to talk about how we um, negotiate our way from crisis period um, to recovery period. So um, if we could move on, please, Lucy. So um, how do we communicate really um, the message to, from staying at home and, and everybody's been petrified to, well, most of us have been petrified to venture out of the home to actually kind of embracing the world of travel again and how are we going to negotiate um, through this and preparing for life after lockdown? If you could move on. If you could move on, Lucy, please. Um, if I had a crystal ball, um, obviously I would be in a much better position, but none of us really know um, what's going to happen and, and um, you know, how, how um, current restrictions are going to be um, eased. And we are, as we all know, expecting an announcement on Sunday, which hopefully is going to um, shed a bit more light onto this. Um, but um, you're all in a much better position than me to know that obviously travel restrictions are going to continue um, and no one really hasn't ag agreed yet a way out of this so um, you know what what should we be communicating to clients um, I've got if we look at the next slide I've got a bit of um, background which I'm not going to spend too much detail on Lucy could you click on Um, I'm not going to spend too much detail on because um, you again have access to these figures more than I do but um, but from what we've seen is that there is still an appetite for travel out there and um, we know people aren't booking holidays right now um, but 63% of UK consumers have indicated that they want to go on some kind of a holiday in 2020 and we do know that the UK market is quite robust as well so as soon as they can travel um, there will be a certain number of people that will want to travel but obviously 
this is going to be kind of severely affected. So um, if we look at how, if we move on to the next slide, Lucy, and look at how um, consumers are actually um, consuming the, the information, Again, these figures have been kind of widely reported, but people are spending more time on their smartphone and they are um, getting information more from their smartphone. They are interested in live streaming events. They do want to hear from brands and what they have to offer. Um, and, and only a few of them believe that kind of communicating in the current climate um, is not beneficial. So it's just looking at how we best do that and certainly looking at it from um, a PR perspective. Um, so moving on. So, um, as I said before, they aren't booking holiday, currently booking holidays. We know that, um, but they are looking and booking from winter uh, 2020 onwards, and um, they are showing a strong intent to travel. We do a weekly um, trends report where we look at. Um, search and people are looking for inspiration online and, and the travel media are still writing about travel and although they have smaller sections in some cases they do actually have even more space to fill because there is obviously less advertising going on so i think the thing to remember as well is that the, in a lot of cases the travel media well in all cases this is a completely new situation to all of us and the travel media are kind of feeling their way through it as much as we are so um, they are still really open to conversation. Um, you know, so they are looking for conversations, they are looking for stories, they are looking for ideas. And um, particularly in the last week, actually, we found that they are um, particularly now beginning to sort of focus forward. A lot of that immediate focus will be um, UK based, um, I'm sure, but um, they are looking for ideas and looking for things to write about once the lockdown has um, restrictions have eased. So if we look, move forward and look through to the three kind of stages of crisis to recovery. Lucy, could you click on? Um, one of the golden rules that we've been saying and we've been we say through any crisis actually um, no matter what it is is that you need to start planning re for recovery as soon as the crisis starts and obviously that um, is a lot easier said than done in a lot of cases when you are under resourced and fighting fires um, from dawn till dusk but if you have the opportunity to be sending ideas to them to the media where appropriate, setting up online briefings and interviews. And again, I know it's a tricky time. We've had a lot of clients who have not wanted to face media because they haven't wanted to be grilled on certain issues, which is fair enough. Um, but not all the media are looking to give you a grilling. In a lot of cases, they are looking just to find out um, information and what's going on. You know, are people searching for this? Have you had inquiries for that? Um, so use that um, if you possibly can to make some new connections. Broadcast, I'll talk again about this a bit later, but they are still looking for ideas. Um, a lot of it um, at the moment, they are looking more for ad funded programs because they're, um, you know, they are struggling as everybody is, but um, there are still opportunities out there for broadcast moving forward because it always takes months and months to set these things up anyway. Um, long lead titles or the Mother Glossy magazines, again, really worth speaking to because um, they do have um, as the name suggests, long lead, so they, they will focus months in advance. Um, I know you've already had conversations about social media, but um, again, you know, make sure that you're keeping talking on social media, that you're amplifying any information. Um, maybe you have links out in resorts or, or hotel managers or whatever that may be, but any kind of information that you can feed through from the locality to whet people's appetite. And I think the main thing um, during this period is also um, is really to fight fear with facts. So just to be very, very um, upfront and factual about the information that you give. Um, I think that's a key thing here. And then moving on to phase two. Um, so looking at phase two, which is the emerging recovery phase, um, really look at how you could possibly prioritise the people who are most likely to respond and travel first. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of um, research out there about who is going to travel first, and the general consensus seems to be that the younger um, population are going to be the millennials, are going to be the ones that are first off the blocks. 
but also um, a lot of the older um, and again I'm very aware that we're working in a current framework of restrictions that we're not sure what they're going to be but a lot of the older market um, they have indicated that they are looking to travel and they have money to spend and they have time and once the restrictions have been eased they want to um, get on a holiday and look at this point really look for inspiration during this research period about where and when they should go and then moving on to phase three Um, the half, this is the hard bit. I mean, this is when, obviously, when we know that restrictions um, have been lifted, we've got an indication of when the airlines are going to fly, where they're going to fly to. Um, and this is where um, really um, there's going to be a mad fight for share of voice. So the more prepared you can be for this um, actual time, the better. Think of stories and images that are going to create cut through. Think of hijacking the news agenda or the things currently that are being said that you can jump on the back of to generate coverage. Um, because this, this, at this point, everybody is going to be fighting for, um, for anybody who is looking to book or research a trip. So um, really think strong and hard about how you are going to um, create cut through at this point and all the contacts that hopefully you will have been able to stay in touch with during the um, fallow period will come into, um, come into their own here and will really help you um, generate some um, Vis you know visibility because this is will obviously going to be a, a key time um, I thought it was also worth just having a quick look at um, a snapshot of media sentiment we um, every week we um, do speak to a broad range of um, editors and writers to have a look at what they're looking for um, so I've just highlighted um, a few conversations here that we've had we have a lot more information than this um, for instance, we spoke to Ben Ross, who's the travel um, sits on the travel desk at the Telegraph. Um, they have um, their section is smaller. They have noticed, um, in line with um, current stats, an increased online viewing. Um, their online and digital subscriptions have gone through the roof. Um, mainly, obviously, this is people who are keeping up to date with news, but they're also looking at other articles. And evergreen digital content is doing really well. They're only planning two weeks ahead and they are looking for um, good news. They are really looking for those green shoots, um, good news stories. Are we, I mean, they've been really interested in all the kind of research information that we've been sending them. Where are people looking to travel? If we've noticed any uplift in bookings to certain destinations that we um, represent, when are they looking to travel? What are they looking for? What's new? Um, so they are really, really, um, looking for that information and um, to add to that we were talking to the Times um, travel desk who actually have a little folder um, obviously an online folder but um, where they are sticking all their kind of research and green shoots information and good news information which they keep referring back to so any little um, small nuggets of information that you might have that you think might be of interest is really important to be sending through to them. Um, if we move on we have a look at um, we've also been speaking to um, Nat Geo we move on, Lucy. Sorry about the lag here. It's um, tricky when you're sharing screens. Lucy, can we move on to the next slide? Thanks. Um, so um, basically, um, they're now working on their end of the year um, for Nat Geo Traveller. Um, they don't know because they um, are pu published bi-monthly. They haven't really can't really comment on a kind of lag on sales, but they are working on their end of year issue. Um, Nat Geo Food is still planned to be published in um, July, so they are um, kind of putting that to bed. They've seen, again, a lot of increase in online and social traffic. Um, people, their readers are interested in reading content from different destinations around the world. Um, their longer stories for inspirational travel are still going ahead. Um, however, um, apologies for the typo, um, features such as the 24 hour city, city breaks, anything of that nature, which obviously is not at all relevant right now, um, is um, they have put on hold. But as soon as they can start sending journos back on press trips, they are going to do so. Um, because obviously they, um, like everybody else, they have pages to fill and stories that they need to write. And then finally, um, just going back to the comment I had, um, if we can move on to the next slide about broadcast media, we do, also have um, a lot of conversations with um, the um, 
independent production companies and they are um and these guys are the ones that make the majority of programs for the mainstream broadcasters and they are still commissioning they are still looking um for new ideas as i said programs are planned um months and months ahead they take a long time to put together so any new ideas they're interested in um, but as i said before um main broadcasters really um, are looking for more ad funded programs which for many is going to be um, an impossibility at this point because that they do tend to be expensive anything i mean the cheapest you're looking at is about thirty thousand pounds so um but but obviously the broadcasters have to put some programs together so that's what they're looking for so based on that kind of background how do you um, look at creating a plan during this point um during this time so um So really, um, your objective is obviously building brand recognition and pro profile during an extremely um, difficult time. And then how do you drive take up long, long term um, using the media to communicate um, with your consumers? Um, I think there are four um, insights that might help with um, developing a strategy for this, which we have been um, using. Obviously, COVID-19 um, is dominating the news agenda. Um, I think we'll have all seen that there are um, opportunities for storytelling. Brands have built a jump on the back of that. Um, tend to be more brands with who can um, communicate that kind of human interest angle. Look at heroes in the industry, people who've been helping out. So mainly tends to be kind of the human interest stories or the NHS focused stories. Um, but there are opportunities there. Um, and people do have, as I've said all the way through, they want to look at the world post lockdown. I mean, everybody is in unknown territory and they people do want to dream. They do want a bit of escapism, even if it is just that. But any content that you have that's going to, to provide that is still being very gratefully received. And as I said before, the media, media are struggling. They have pages to fill and they need to come up with new ideas. So, um, you know, they are still looking for um, stories to entice their readers. And um, again, going back to that point that the human interest stories, so anything, even if you know of somebody in one of the resorts that you sell or anything um, that has a, a really nice, good news story to tell, anything of that nature um, is, is being looked at. So just really to summarize, um, uh, sort of looking at ongoing media relations and what we are really um, doing for clients right now is um, any online briefings or interviews um, that that might be relevant we um, for our UK based clients obviously that opportunity is now opening up um, for them because a lot of the focus right now is going to be on UK tourism but that is not that won't continue I mean people aren't going to stay in the UK indefinitely so um, so there's been a big opportunity there, but that will broaden out. Um, as I said, um, any aspirational images, current trends. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion um, on the travel desk that people are looking for wellness stories, um, fresh air, treatments, anything that well, once people, once we're out of this, where people can really kind of um, get back to nature, breathe some fresh air, whatever it might be, hiking, walking, those ideas are being very, um, carefully looked at right now um, I've taught you for had discussions about social media so I won't spend too much long on that but any content that can be repurposed any influencers that you might have worked with in the past that you can encourage to repurpose content and that's always a great idea um, make sure that when you're targeting your media media pitches that they are you are sort of focusing on the main demographic group groups that are relevant to your brand as I said before, um, broadcast is a, you know, that this is the time to be talking to those. Develop a bank of people of, um, if you've had media who've traveled with you, if you've worked with influencers who've traveled with you, who, who um, have had a great experience, you know, you've got the goodwill there, go back to them. Um, use this time to kind of develop, um, work on any information, product sheets, destination information that might be relevant to media. Um, look at um, approaching different brand partners who moving forward might want to work with you and any other partner press offices organizations that might um tourist boards that you might be able to partner up with again um, now's the time you may not get very far on the um, conversation but at least to make yourself visible and make that introduction 
So, um, I mean, that's that's kind of a very brief synopsis of things to think about right now when um, when talking about the media and, and what they might um, want from you. And um, yeah, I mean, if anybody has any questions, please just let me know. Thanks, Helen. That was really insightful and really helpful to know how, you know, to get some press attention at the moment and target marketing as well as developing future strategies. So thank you very much uh, for providing that presentation and going through it for us. Um, we'll move on if that's okay. Um, and if anyone does have any questions, then please uh, use the Q&A facility and we, we can put those to Helen. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Martin talked to us about what we should be thinking about for the future. Um, and we had some great feedback on his presentation. Um, a lot can happen in two weeks. So we thought it'd be useful to bring Martin back to update us on his thoughts and any further insights for your businesses. So Martin, if I can hand over to you. Yeah, no problem. Let me just uh, share the screen. Thank you. Hopefully you can see the presentation there. Yes, we can. Great. Okay. Um, well, look, for, so firstly, thanks to Helen for that. I think that was um, really useful. And <clears throat> a, a lot of the early part I was, I was going to talk about in some of those um, numbers and what we're seeing at the moment, she, she's already covered helpfully. So I, I, I'll sort of skip through this and uh, very happy to take questions at, at the end or, or as follow-ups. Really, I, I wanted to just Show, show you this. This is something we've started to develop and it's the, the thinking is, is what are the questions that we need to start asking ourselves and answering in order to prepare for this bounce back and th this is something that um, we've already put out and, and if you haven't seen a copy we, we, we'll, we'll make sure that it, something is sent to you. It's certainly not exhaustive but it's starting to try and build up this bank of questions and, and what I wanted to do here is just maybe dive into a couple of these different subsectors and just pull out, pull out that in a bit more detail. I think that the big question, and look, Helen's already touched on, on that in enough detail, is when are things going to start to, to, to recover is, is, the, is the big unknown question. We've um, looked at you know, previous um, incidents and, and, and sort of global recessions. This is the rolling last 12 months of UK outbound departures over the last 30 years or so. And you can see, if you plot a bunch of different um, incidents on there, that barely, barely the, the the growth in passengers barely kind of registered a, um, a, a a blip in any of those sort of fairly big events. The only one that, of any sort of size was the financial crisis. And when you look at the financial crisis, the just purely on outbound passenger numbers, the the, the sort of peak to trough drop was about twenty percent um, a, a reduction in passengers and it took around seven years for that to recover to get back to, to where we were very very long sort of bathtub shaped recession as it's been called I, I think there's there's sort of two opposing things in, in my mind on this on the one hand you know Helen's just touched on on some figures for, from her data that sort of 60 percent ish down um, the, the latest figures I've seen are you know a, a good degree worse than that I should say I'm predisposed to be more negative. That's, Helen went into a very positive, uh, creative environment. I went into regulation and plus I'm a Sunderland fan. So I do tend to see things a bit more negatively. But the latest figures on, on a variety of different metrics, whether it's web searches up until till just last week on, on, on flights, whether it's um, revenue generated per night for, from hotels, is all sort of consistently coming out at around 85% to 90% down at the moment. And obviously that's, I don't think you could compare that with the 20% we're showing on this slide, but you don't know when that's going to get back. And that's the big challenge. I mean, again, I think we've just talked about how that recovery will be unevenly distributed. We, we've certainly mentioned that before, whether that's by demographic, um, but, but undoubtedly it will, it will be by destination. I think there's, there's no overall consensus. I think it really depends on what kind of business you're, you're running. But, you know, based on the conversations we're having, I think it, something like this probably isn't, isn't far off. You know, it's, this is what currently people are thinking. So if you are down at that 90% down at the moment in terms of, of bookings, domestic maybe starts to look something like that. I, I do think it's, we're in for a prolonged downturn. I think, you know, the news out today is the, the, the uh, potentially the, the worst recession on record that, that we're heading into. And so how we come out of that will obviously dictate whether consumers are booking. But you could see domestic travel starts to get back 
something like that. So maybe as as far as the, the summer, we're down to kind of um, only 70 or 60% or down compared to previous years, and, and we gradually improve from there. But I don't think, you know, even as even by the time we get to the next booking season of, of January, my personal view is that we'll still be a good degree lower than we were at, you know, 2019, 2018 levels. I think it will take a couple of years for to, to get back to those sorts of um, booking demands. I, I do think international travel maybe looks something a bit more like that, where it, it's going to take much longer for a whole variety of reasons that, that we've talked about, you know, the, the, the coming out of lockdown, the complexity around what that looks like, what different countries do at different times, what the availability of, of services are, uh, all of that I think just just plays to a, a reduction in demand for a, for a while longer. Um, and again, you know, clearly none of this is, uh, is it's as accurate as anyone else's predictions, it's just the, the kind of messaging I think we're getting when we're, when we're talking to clients. So with that in mind, and, and with, with that sort of backdrop, just turn, turn back to those um, questions in the different sectors i guess the, the ones i'd pull out and just spend a bit more time on the first is financial and so absolutely the the the, the, the focus on your own finances and, and the questions you need to be asking based on your best assumptions about what your business might might look like coming out of all of this uh, i think the first thing is if you haven't already started to do this you really need to be thinking about right sizing your, your own profit and loss account you know in simple terms that means thinking in in that sort of way you know it's it's um if you're planning for a significantly lower gross profit then your cost base in that sort of second diagram there your cost base needs to be cut accordingly and you know i would encourage everybody to to, to take the steps early on, on that i'm sure most of you have, have done what you can but um certainly if you look at the big announcements coming out of the likes of virgin ba airbnb all of these big brands are probably a bit a bit later than, than than a lot of smaller businesses are now coming out and saying well look, we're planning for a significantly smaller business we're cutting right back to the very very basic core products that we do we're, we're turning off any of the nice to have anything that doesn't generate revenue and the cost base has to has to fit that um i think the second thing once once you've worked out what that um profit and loss account should look like and what your cost base needs to be is just an absolute laser focus on cash I think we shared a, a, a very, very basic cash flow model of, a few weeks ago. Um, here's a, a sort of slightly updated version, just with a, a few extra things. And apologies, that's very short on, very small on screen, and I'm happy to share the, the Excel file. But just a few things I pull out because the danger is always with cash flows, particularly people who um, aren't used to doing this and maybe have to either go and spend some money to get it done or, or spend a lot of time sitting down to, to work it out. Is that it? It can't sit on a shelf. It, it's got to be embedded into your daily processes. So on this version here, for example, we've built a, a, a piece at the bottom where it's tracking your actual cash balances per month. And then it's looking at what that looks like versus where you thought you were going to be. And that very small line in italics there is the variance. I think you've got to be building into your processes that at the very least every month, you're tracking your actuals versus your, your where you thought you'd be. And you're investigating what those variances are because they could be great reasons like, um, more customers than, than than your pessimistic forecasts, or it could be timing differences that you, you you maybe get a false sense of security, and maybe it's it's the fact that you've um, you know bounced some of your supplier payments into a, into a different move. But you need to build this in, and you need to be regularly looking at it. And, and the other thing is, all of these all of these actions that we're taking at the moment, whether that's drawing down on a, on a C bills or a bounce back loan, whether it's deferring VAT, whether it's um, you know, issuing refund credit notes that are going to be, be for future departures. All of those have a future consequence. And the real danger I think we, we face is that businesses are so focused on the next 13 weeks, next two months, getting through that really difficult period, is that you take your eye off the slightly longer medium term of when these things start, start to bite. And so, you know, a, a Seabills loan is, is free money for the next 12 months, but then there are capital repayments that kick in, there's interest costs, you know, those deferred VAT bills do need to be paid at some point. So you absolutely need to have a, a, a process in place where you can have a long visibility. I mean, in this case, we're, we're, we're projecting out to, uh, I think the model goes out to the back end of 2021. But if you can go further, obviously no one has a crystal ball, but the whole purpose of this isn't, isn't really to, um, to, to show that you can read the future. The purpose is to say, what levers do you need to pull if, if, you, if, if you're trading along, this is your base case, what levers would you need to pull if you're off that base case? 
and it's about having early visibility and early warning systems in place. It's, it's not to say I, I was right or I was wrong. It's about understanding why you were wrong and making sure that you can react accordingly. So that, that cash focus is absolutely critical, I think, and uh, you know, very happy to, to, to support, happy to make this model available and, and, and to sort of answer any other questions on it. I think the next thing I want to draw attention to is suppliers, really. I, I think, you know, for everybody, in this travel industry we're all facing this this problem but so is every other business in the world and your suppliers will be facing this and so the question you have to ask is when things do get back to quote unquote normal whatever that looks like can your suppliers deliver the quality of service that that you you're used to your customers are used to and that they're sort of contractually committed to issuing so if they've got no money can they afford to keep up the repairs and maintenance on their hotel have they laid off staff and therefore you know, sort of faulty tower style, you're sitting ringing the bell for ages on, on, on return or you're not getting served in the restaurant. Real questions I think you need to, you need to ask. You know, in, in addition, can they keep your customers safe? So are they implementing procedures around the social distancing? You know, they, if, you, if you're using these guys to deliver the service, you need to make sure that they're um, keeping up with the cleanliness protocols, that they've got their own insurance in place. I mean, we're seeing all over the all over the country that insurance is being refused and turned down. No reason to think that a, a boutique hotel is going to find it easy to, to get it either. So you need to be making sure your, 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 your processes pick up these things. You're certainly asking the right questions. And, you know, if it wasn't obvious, the reason for that is because as a package organiser, it, it's you that carries the ultimate responsibility for this stuff. You know, if... if, if um, the suppliers that you're entrusting your kind of hard hard won clients to are delivering a bad service then at best you lose that customer at worst you're, you're, you're facing a you know potential um uh, court case yourself you know i think the third thing i just draw attention to is is the destinations again certainly more questions than answers at this point but it, whether it's international or domestic that there will be some requirements and, and, and protocols so you know in, in, this is a in Hong Kong, there's various sort of coronavirus um, 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 requirements to, to commit to on, on arrival, going into some sort of um, lockdown or some sort of self-isolation period. There will be new requirements that you'll need to get to grips with destination by destination on what to do when your customers are, are, are arriving or their health checks, or is there more of a chance of people being deferred at the border or sent back home at the border? And therefore, what processes do you have to look after those? customers i guess if you're selling the kinds of tours and packages where they're, they're sort of dependent on attractions and and, and and locations being open how you keep abreast of what what is open when it's open if we head up into this sort of on off lockdown type scenario you need to have processes in place to make sure you're you're ahead of the game in, in, in being aware of um, parks being closed and I guess the more difficult one really is what sort of welcome are your customers going to get when they when they go to these places? I mean, we're talking about domestic tourism, but certainly heading into the lockdown, we heard of a number of scenarios where um, people wanted to head to remote parts of you know the Hebrides in, in, in Scotland, but were being effectively turned away because, frankly, the people didn't want customers, didn't want tourists there because of the, the risk of, of spreading the disease. And if you spent a lot of money on um, on, on a tour and you end up with a, a, an awful experience that the pubs are all closed, the restaurants are closed and nobody wants to serve you, then um, it's not much of an experience you're, you're selling. So I think it's it, introducing processes where you can to be ahead of the, the game on these. There are services out there that will, um, will, will provide some of this, this insights in terms of, you know, landing conditions, uh, visa conditions, whether there's uh, a sort of move in that direction. So they the, were the three I wanted to draw attention to. As I say, we've gone into a few more. It's definitely not exhaustive. And so if you've got comments and, and feedback and, and, and additional areas you think we should look at, certainly, um, you know, we've got a very small section on, on the marketing side of things, but some of the, the, the points that Helen made, I think we, you know, we should definitely build into that. But um, happy to share this, very happy to have conversations on it and very happy to take any questions. Thanks, Chris. Over to you. Thanks, Martin. That was really helpful. And um, yeah, as you've said, we, we will share that with members and um, the, particularly the, the template that you showed us there so that people can use that. I think that's incredibly useful um, for planning for, for the future. Um, we have had a couple of questions. They're, they're kind of specific questions on, again, airlines. Um, so I don't know, again, if, if that's yourself or, or any of the other, your TTC colleagues. 
Um, I mean, you specifically talked about how some airlines are cutting capacity in the future, potentially. And obviously, lots of people are trying to rebook for next year, um, amending their holidays. It, should people therefore be issuing tickets on the flights that are held at the moment? Um, and obviously, the other concern is that prices could go up. Do you know, can airlines increase the prices on flights that have been ticketed? Uh, so I think it comes down to contractual, from an airline's point of view, it comes down to the contractual terms and, and, and their ability to, to surcharge. I'm pretty sure airlines can do that, actually. Tour operators have some, some, um, some restrictions on the circumstances when they can do it. Actually, they were tightened up in, in, in 2018, so it is harder for tour operators to do. You've got to have it as a, um, an option in your terms and conditions. And actually, if you're preserving your right to increase prices, you actually also have to, to offer price reductions if, if they ever went down. So lots of people didn't do that and didn't change their terms and conditions. Yeah. Um, so, it, so it's a really difficult one. I, I think um, things will become clear, I suppose, as, as we get more of an understanding of what airlines are doing to, to change their schedules. But you know, that, that is one of the issues. When you, when you go back to this refund credit note debate, you know, a, re, a refund credit note and then a new booking at future kind of protects the operator because it's a new booking if that price is double let's say the refund credit note goes towards that that doubled price but the consumer is still liable to, for the, the difference whereas if you take your existing booking and you just change the dates and push it down the road technically that's still under the same terms and conditions and so those limitations on your ability to surcharge do kick in so it is certainly a consideration when you're working out how you solve that current issue Thank you. And um, uh, the, again, another specific question on airlines. So um, on British Airways, apparently their trade line number seems to have been discontinued. So um, operators are having to join the long consumer queue. Have you, have you heard anything about this at all? If not, then perhaps, you know, if any other members on the call have had any experience and any tips, you know, if they could get in touch with me, that would be particularly useful. So that specifically is not, not something I've come across other than just generally airlines are making life a bit harder for people to, to find the, the, the refund route. You know, EasyJet used to have a very simple process and now it's sort of buried uh, and, and it's a bit more convoluted. And, and I guess that's all um, tactics to slow down the, the, the flow of money out the door. Um, yeah, but I, I, I can't really add any insights into that. But yeah, certainly if, if that's one that other members can, can share information, that would be useful. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to all of our panellists uh, for joining us. And thank you to all uh, of our members who've joined and, and, and asked questions particularly. Um, please let us have any feedback that, um, on, on the webinars to help us to shape them for the future in terms of what you would like to um, obtain advice and support on. And we'll be certain to take that into account and get in touch with anyone to, um, to arrange that for future webinars. Uh, details will be sent out um, early next week of our next one. But in the meantime, um, please have an enjoyable bank holiday weekend. Thank you. Goodbye.